Next, joining us now is Shara Evans. She's a technology futurist, uh, and she's going to be talking to us about the future of driving. Shara Evans, first and foremost, how do I become a technology futurist? Well, it's a long and winding path, and I certainly didn't go into my university days thinking that I was going to be a technology (laughs) futurist. But I actually have a background with an undergrad degree in political science and social studies, you know, social sciences and demography, and did my grad work in computer science and spent my early career as a software engineer designing, back in the old days, data networking um, <laughs> protocols back before the internet was the internet. And I came up through the technology ranks and then rolled out networks around the world and wow. was really... Um, building my reputation as someone who was able to communicate the business value of all these cool technologies that I was helping to design and develop into, at the time, my carrier clients and help them understand how they were going to make money out of it. And along the way, um, you know, I did program management and sales and marketing and started my first tech analyst firm over 20 years ago. But people started calling me a futurist because the trends in the business cases that I had been talking to my clients about unfolded in the way that I had predicted. And the label, I guess, got attached to me. (laughs) So obviously, uh, you know, the this podcast is is about all things cars, um, and one of the real hot button topics at the moment is automation. Um, and I, I mean, I guess the first question is, how long do you think it will be until we see full autonomy in vehicles? Well. In a lot of luxury vehicles, you can already get full autonomy and, you know, you can buy self-driving cars and trucks today, full stop. But when it comes to mass market, I think we're going to see fully autonomous mode features and or electric or hybrid electric uh, vehicle capabilities as being very widely available in the 2020 and 2021 car model year. Do you think that the, uh, I guess, the ability for cars to be able to talk to each other is one of the the real sort of, I guess, a a stumbling block with with autonomy? Well, um, it's interesting that you say that because as I was thinking about how things are going to unfold, you know, I've mapped out the kind of communications that are necessary. And one of the things is onboard sensors so that the cars can in effect, operate in solo mode without needing to talk to the stop signs or traffic lights or any other vehicle. But where it gets really powerful is when you have these vehicle-to-vehicle networks that the cars can talk to each other as well as the traffic and transport infrastructure, then you're going to see things that are very highly harmonized and highly autonomous. Because you've got that extra layer of communication happening there. But it's got to be real time, no latency, really super fast. Well, it sounds like, I mean, the the future is coming a lot faster than probably any of us predicted, except maybe, of course, you. Um, But (laughs) do you do you see a day when cars won't exist? I mean, if 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 that does happen, what's going to replace them? Well, again, um, when you look at a timeline for you know, will there be a day when cars don't exist? I think we're still a long way off. And the reason is that, number one, people and companies have a huge asset base. They've invested a lot of money in today's existing vehicle fleet, and they're not going to just throw it away because there's something else that's new. Um, Another thing that is really important to consider is where autonomous mode may and may not be used. And I think we'll see it first on highways, and we may even end up with dedicated traffic lanes that are allocated for fully autonomous vehicles. And in the cities, we may well end up with the same thing. Today we have bus lanes, but those bus lanes could be converted to fully autonomous lanes. But as you start going outside of the highways and the metropolitan areas, you end up with roads that are very sparsely traveled and may even be dirt roads and may not even be fully mapped out. 
and I don't think that autonomous vehicles are going to be used in those places other than for, say, the mining industry um, or other, you know, really specific industries. You probably still have people that will drive their cars or trucks or motorbikes in manual mode in these areas, at least over the next couple of decades. And the other thing that I think could really change as we start to see autonomous vehicles, especially in cities, is car ownership. And a lot of people have cars because it gets them to and from work in the fastest, um, often, but not always, least expensive way. But once you start getting autonomous vehicles that can do pickup and delivery from home to work or wherever you're going, the incentive to own and garage and maintain and insure your own car may actually go away because it's cheaper to use um, some sort of car as a service, you know, or driving as mm. a service, you know, and it will be a lot cheaper than today's taxis or even um, services like an Uber or Lyft where you still have a human driver. If you can imagine having just the vehicle running costs that you're paying for, you know, plus, you know, the service fee, then that could actually end up being a lot less expensive than having a car that sits in a garage most of the time, you know, whether that garage be your home garage or in the city, you know, in a parking garage while you're at work. Well, I'm. Uh, I, I mean, look, I I think that we can both agree that those days are, are certainly fast approaching. But I am absolutely relieved to know that I won't be having to hand the keys back to my car anytime soon. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, with that, uh, we've also sort of got a, an industrial sort of move towards, uh, I, I guess, you know, robots. I mean, what what industry oh. do you think will be the first to go? You know, so called full robot. You know, I've been thinking about that, and calling the first one is actually a little bit of a hard call, but I would say that one of the industries that's already very, very heavily investing in robotics is in the whole warehousing and logistics area, and here I'm thinking about companies like Amazon that have highly autonomous warehouses, you know, robots that actually move around big stacks of shelves as well as robots that can pick and stow goods on the shelves. Um, there's so much investment happening in artificial intelligence and in robots to give them even more capabilities. So there are techniques in the world of AI called deep learning, and I'll explain it in layman's terms because you know I'm not going to get all techy and complex <laughs> on you for this. But basically, it's a technique that allows the robot to teach itself by feeding it information. And along with that are techniques that they call reinforcement learning and imitation learning, where humans get into the loop of teaching robots how to do things. So if you can imagine in a warehouse that has all kinds of goods from, you know, let's say soft clothing to delicate glass, um, a robot that's picking out these items would have to grasp these items differently depending on how big it was, how heavy it was, how fragile it was, all sorts of properties. And you can imagine a human in a virtual reality um, simulator, almost like the things you see actors do in movies when they're making these CGI sci-fi movies, mm. but actually controlling the robot and teaching the robot how hard or soft to grasp things and the best way to pick them up and fold them and put them in boxes. Um, there are already companies that are starting to experiment with that. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's, it sounds pretty sci-fi, but it's not science fiction, it's science now. And there are other industries that I think are also really good candidates to go, if not full robot, you know, nearly full robot, mining here in Australia, that's a big one, mm. and agriculture too. And the reason is that the robots are able to go into, especially in mining, into dangerous places that humans can't. They're loaded with sensors, and they're able to get all kinds of information about the environment, whether it be temperature in a coal pit or fungi on plants and moisture levels and soil nutrients and all sorts of things that a human being who's walking in an agricultural grove wouldn't pick up with our human senses. So it's a robotic canary. 
Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, yeah. But actually, to me, more than a canary, because the canary just tells you, "Oops, it's unsafe." Whereas the robot's actually able to go into the unsafe areas, do things, collect lots of big data, and then hand that over to humans to do the next step. I, I think one of the things that we've seen, uh, particularly with, uh, I guess you could say, connected cars, is um, that they are they part of a, a an ecosystem. You know that that sort of extends beyond just driving around in in our cities. Um, so if vehicles are becoming fully uh, autonomous, how will this affect the the look and feel, or even the running of our cities? But there are so many things about cities that are going to change, and one of the other big changes in cities is population growth and the fact that more and more people are moving into cities and buildings are getting taller and we're using more and more technology in cities and in buildings and it's part of this whole Internet of Things movement to put sensors everywhere to be able to autonomously control temperature in buildings, to be able to do things like smart parking. So, Kurt, you've probably driven into a parking garage and see the, the red and the green sensors that tell you where there are spaces and you can just glance yep. down the aisle and see if you see the green. If you can imagine driving your car in a few years and having sensors for every parking space in the entire city, whether it be in a garage or on the street, communicating information to the navigation system in your car and you know, using a combination of sensors and artificial intelligence, allowing that combination to drive you and your car or guide you in your car to the best parking space for your destination. You know, that's the sort of automation we're going to see. And there are just so many things that are going to change in the cities, too. Um, you know, in talking about the future of cars and, you know, where all this could go, one of the concept videos that I saw that is really interesting is a drone, which is, in effect, a personal flying taxi. And I saw one of the world's first prototypes live last January at the Consumer Electronics Show. It was from a Chinese company called Ehang. And it literally is almost like a little mini helicopter that autonomously can take you up to um, 23 minutes flying destination at 100 kilometers per hour. Wow. Yeah, and I've seen concept videos from Airbus where they're, you know, these are just animation, so it's not real yet, but where you've got like an autonomous, almost pod-like vehicle that goes to a docking station and then rotors clamp down on the vehicle and it turns into a flying drone or a flying taxi. And off you go. Have you ever been stuck in traffic and you just wish that you you could sort of pick up and fly and hop over the traffic. All well, the time. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. Well, you know, that sort of thing is like so science fiction, but people are working on designing that now too. And there's one other um, really cool transport technology, which I'm sure you would have heard of, but I'm not sure if your listeners may have. Um, it's called a Hyperloop. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of that? I have, um, yeah. Yeah, so basically, just for those who may not have heard of it, it's taking a big tube that will be able to transport vehicles or cargo and having it at near vacuum so that you've got no air friction and using magnetic levitation to hurl these pods of either you know people or cargo at average cruising speeds of 760 kilometers an hour and top cruising speeds of between 1200 and 1300 kilometers per hour and we're going to i believe see these kinds of systems weaving in along the eastern seaboard of australia i hope um as well as lots of other countries in cutting down drive times from places like Sydney to Newcastle to a 10-minute hyperloop. Yeah. And if you can imagine that you've got an autonomous vehicle that is able to, if you like, handshake with the hyperloop system, you would literally have the car take you to the hyperloop you know, um, hub and just like you would have your car on a ferry today to get across a body of water, you'd you know be in 
if you like a hyperloop system, maybe for the long distance portion of your drive, gets you super fast, you know, between cities. And then when the car debarks, it goes back into autonomous mode, driving at normal driving speeds. And I think that sort of hybrid system of personal autonomous vehicle and long distance autonomous um, transport is also going to emerge, but we're at least 10 years, maybe more away from that sort of thing. Gosh, that's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I mean, and it's as a, as a kid uh, growing up in, in the eighties and there was definitely sort of a massive explosion of sci-fi. It's just fascinating to, to hear that that sort of technology, I mean, you know, some of these sort of things were, um, I guess, you know, flights of fancy and total recall and Blade Runner and things like that. And yet there there is definitely an element of, of truth and, and real development that's going on behind this. Yeah, and I was actually thinking of Total Recall the other night and, you know, thinking about how accurate it was. And the one thing that Total Recall got wrong was that the autonomous car actually had a physical robot taxi driver, if you remember. Yeah, Johnny you know, Cab. Yep. Yeah, Johnny Cab, and he was quipping with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I guess maybe it was put in as a plot device, you know, to allow quip. But today's autonomous vehicle, even though it's a robot driving the car, the robot is the car. You're not going to have a physical robot in the driver's seat. Yeah, I mean, well, uh, our phones are already talking to us now. I mean, I have a, uh, a you know, a, a full sort of Google uh, Home set up at, at home and um, just how much that thing is, I mean, aside, w- once you sort of forego the, the fact that the thing is listening to you all the time, um, that that's learning, you know, all the time about habits and behaviours and interests and things like that. So, I mean, it, it stands to reason that, you know, even just as an extension of um, your navigation and, you know, my, uh, my phone will tell me me that uh, your usual route to work is going to take you 24 minutes, but there's heavy traffic and today it's going to take 32 minutes, but I've got a, you know, a, a shortcut you can take. I mean, yeah, it's, it's very, very easy to see where this is all heading. Oh, and it's already happening with some of the phone apps. And, you know, you're absolutely right about voice recognition um, and voice interfaces coming more and more into our lives. And, there I see a double-edged sword. You know, there's so much convenience to be able to talk in natural language and have it understand you, which today's um, AI, sometimes they get it right and sometimes they're not quite there yet. You know, sometimes they don't understand. But that's going to get better and better, like, within the next one, two, and three years. You know, so that's, like, immediate horizon. <laughs> and I can see voice interfaces directly in cars where instead of – going into your car and manually entering your destination into the nav system, you'll get into your car and you'll say, I want to go to, you know, wherever it is, and it will look up the address for you and map out the best route and maybe ask you if you mind paying the tolls or have your personal preference stored, have a little mini conversation with you and then take you there. Well, actually, you're uh, you're spot on because um, so one of the technologies that that Volkswagen has, and and I know a lot of other manufacturers do now as well, is um, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto integration into the car's um, media unit, uh, and with that, for example, so I have a a, a Google Pixel phone, um, and with that, I can actually say, okay, Google, I want to go and get some pizza. And um, it will the the phone will then say to me, and running this all through sort of the the car as well by by proxy, but it'll say, okay, here are a bunch of um, different pizza places around. Which one do you want to go to? Click, um, and uh, it'll uh, it'll take you to that that very pizza place. So it's it's quite fascinating to you know to sort of see that because that's already by default having the the phone there, that's already in the um, in the car. Oh, I totally agree with you. I'm seeing it across a lot of auto manufacturers where there is tighter and tighter integration with mobile operating system and apps. And, you know, one of the other things that we're going to see is more and more artificial intelligence built directly into the car as opposed to relying on your phone to be the AI agent. So if you like, you'd have the AI in your car talking to the AI in your phone, whether it be Google or Siri or Cortana or, you know, whatever else comes along 
in the next couple of years. But the thing that we have to be very wary of are the privacy implications of these devices always listening for their keyword, like, okay, Google or Hey Siri or yeah. whatever it is. And by default, always recording and transcribing and in some cases reselling the data that is being recorded. And there are a lot of situations where it would be highly inappropriate to have your personal or company data recorded, stored, and transcribed and on sold to third parties. Mm. This is another one of these uh, sort of crystal ball kind of moments, but what what is on the horizon for in-car technology? Well, let me share something with you that's already rolling out, and most people have never heard of it, and it's happening in Australia and New Zealand. It's precision GPS. And today, you know, with your GPS on your phone or in your car, you can have a discrepancy of, say, 10 meters, with precision GPS, you're going to get three to five centimeter accuracy. And it's a project that um, Geoscience Australia is rolling out in combination with a range of partners, including you know, satellite um, vendors. And they're using multiple satellite signals as well as um, ground-based augmentation to improve the accuracy and reliable of GPS signals. And it's going to go out to the masses for free, just like you get GPS for free right now. You're not paying a fee. And that's pretty exciting. So what does this mean for older cars, I guess? Well, um, with the navigation system, they're tuning into the satellite signal. So as long as they're tuning in to the right satellite frequencies, they should be able to get this automatically. It just will improve their mapping. I, I, it's actually really, really exciting, and I, and I think um, I actually had the to you know to give you an anecdote. I actually had my first experience with, um, I, I guess, an updated navigation system recently, where I was driving to somewhere, and um, and I was actually using uh, Google Maps, and Google had sort of come through and said, "I've actually found a shorter way to get there. It's going to save you another four minutes. Do you want me to do that?" And you say yes, and away we go. And I, I kind of. I mean, that was sort of a, a real eye-opener for me. I mean, it also saved me four minutes, so I was very, very happy yeah. about that. But um, it, it it really is sort of starting to, to sort of just interact with our very day-to-day, -day, isn't it? It is. And when it comes to autonomous vehicles, this precision accuracy is really going to make a difference because the vehicle has to find, not just with its own sensors, you know, it's got to find its own way. So it needs to understand where it is in relation to the destination that it's heading to, the road infrastructure, traffic lights, bridges, all sorts of things. And the more accurate it's able to, the more accurate the GPS signal is, the better it's able to plot its course. So what piece of in-car technology are you most looking forward to or, or hoping for? Well, there's a couple. And one that I'm really looking for is augmented reality. That's basically getting a digital overlay of information that might show up on um, your car windshield as you're driving. Mm -hmm. So when you're navigating today, you're looking up and down from your nav station, um, you know, your nav system or your phone to the road, you know, but you're gazing away from actually driving the vehicle. Once you start having augmented reality with these kinds of displays, you're no longer defocusing your attention from the road. And not only that, but you can see additional information about destinations along the way, scenic routes along the way. You can see text messages that pop up without Again, you know, taking your eyes off of the wheel. Once we're in fully autonomous mode, that might not make a difference, but we're going to have a transition period before everybody's in fully autonomous mode with brand new cars in a few years until it becomes quite frequent. Um, so that kind of technology is going to be really interesting. Um, really, really good natural language voice interfaces. I think we're probably one, two years away from really, really good voice interfaces that understand us like 99% of the time. And talking to your car and telling it where you want to go or the things you want to do. We're also going to see things like 
handshakes between cars and especially electric cars or hybrid electric cars and payment systems for topping up fuel, in this case electricity, at um, an electric station or even to handshake with parking meters so that you're not searching for spare change or getting out and using your credit card. You know, at some stage in the very near future, you'll park somewhere and your car will handshake with the nearest parking meter and do that for you. And if you need to extend your stay, it'll top it up for you. So is is handshake the the, the term for... Uh, operating system to operating system connectivity is that is that an industry yeah. term? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess um, I'm going back to my early days in designing data networks. But whenever um, you've got two completely different systems that need to exchange information with each other, and it's um, on a casual basis rather than as part of an integrated system that you're designing for. Um, let's say a customer application, that's almost like a handshake type of mm-hmm. transaction, as I would call it. I guess I was getting a bit techy on you there. No, <laughs> no, no, I, but it, it's very interesting. I mean, and it, just on the augmented reality, I mean, we uh, we have cars. I mean, Volkswagen has cars now with, with a, with a heads-up display that will give you um, basic sort of um, information on, you know, speed and, and you know, uh, indications and things like that to the road. Um, but w- are we talking full windshield augmented reality sort of pieces? Are we, are we talking about almost like a Google Glass for the entire front of the car? Potentially, yes, and even beyond that. Um, you know, what some of the prototypes that I have seen actually allow displays on the windshield to communicate information to pedestrians that may be walking in front of or next to or near cars. So if you can imagine an autonomous car coming up to a pedestrian crossing and having information sliding across its windshield that doesn't um, obstruct the driver's view, but alerts the pedestrian that says, I see you, it's okay to cross, I'm stopping. Something like that. Um, it, It really is quite interesting. And if you're not driving the car, you know, like let's say you're in the passenger seat, the augmented reality display may be showing you a completely different view from what the driver is seeing. Wow. So with, uh, with that in mind, and I know that you've sort of touched on this a little bit, but cars are becoming fully uh, automated. What are some of those non-driving related technologies that you think might be sort of making it to vehicles? You know, I mean, what's on the horizon and what are some of the theoretical sort of advancements that people are working on now? Well, you know, as I had mentioned earlier, you know, one of the really exciting things is precision GPS. Mm. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've been driving in my car and the nav system gets confused and starts taking me in loop-de-loops because it's <laughs> lost satellite signals and it doesn't know exactly where it's at and it wants to take me around the longest possible way. Um, having better built-in nav systems and having the ability to tap into maps that are updated by vehicles that have computer vision and take into account the latest traffic, the latest construction works, the latest pothole, you know, whatever it may be, and being able to avoid that mess, that's really exciting and it's on the near-term horizon. And artificial intelligence, too, in the cars, um, and being able to talk to the cars, you know, and just say, you know, take me to work, (laughs) (laughs) whatever, or take me to the airport, Um, and it knows what you're talking about, or, you know, take me home, because it knows what your home is, and just really, really simple interfaces, or telling it to, you know, play a particular radio station, or, you know, choose a particular genre of music that you want to hear, and just actually talking to it in natural language, hands-free, so that, you know, even if you're still manually driving your car, which a lot of us will be doing for quite some time. Thank goodness. You know, (laughs) yes, exactly, especially from a Volkswagen perspective. But, (laughs) you know, having that ability to do it without taking your eyes off of the road and having to remember complex steps of instructions, that's really cool. Well, look, that's all we've got time for. Shara Evans, thank you so much for joining us. It was really, really great to talk to you.